Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And then I was just wondering now, now that you're speaking about mentorship and moving on to collaboration and especially collaboration among scientists, which you've mentioned in when you were sharing your science journey about you, how you are able to come together with different scientists, both from Zimbabwe and outside to collaborate on different projects. And I was just wondering, um, as a scientist, um, given how there's this push to get ahead in your career, there's this push to have these achievements that will put you ahead, but also acknowledging the role of collaboration. How do you, in your work, foster that collaboration and supportive environment within your teams and how can we learn from that? So I guess there's no one size fits all. Understand that. That's really important. Um, what is what and I am a big fan of collaboration and teamwork. I I am where I am because of all the people that have reached out to, to support me and also people that I've reached out to support. So um, I feel like the word collaboration is entrenched in my, um, in my DNA pretty much because I really believe that if we want to do uh, bigger and greater in science and anywhere is that we have to talk to each other, we have to work together, we have to support each other. And of course, sometimes there are areas where you don't always have to do that. But I think for majority of success stories, they'll tell you that you know collaboration is key. Now, while you, you may, I may be a, you know, we all are big fans of teamwork and collaboration. You always, they always, it can be a bit challenging. Uh, starting with identifying the right types of collaborators, the right types of team members and teamwork people to work with. Uh, but not only that, you might already be in a team team or in a collaboration, even if there are people that are coming from different backgrounds or different ideologies. Um, you have to understand, you have to make an effort to understand how that people are different. And it's understanding how you can work with um, each individual and how can, what is it, what is it that, and understanding what is it that's motivating them. And um, obviously you have to understand what motivates you and being able to communicate that with the other, you know, other people that are either in your team, be it you're a manager or you're, you know, uh, sort of, you know, in a project and so forth. So, um, so it and it, it can be challenging, but what is um, understand that it is important to to listen, to sometimes take a step back, it and 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 just you know study the study the not necessarily study the people in that in that sense, but to understand sort of like what what is it that they like, what do they what don't they like, uh, how can I influence them, but how can we then move together. And when there is conflict, it's really important again to be um, to not be afraid to um, talk about it. And to um, my my approach is always look, we want we need to find a way to resolve certain you know if there are conflicts that are impacting on the work. And so I have um, other than obviously you know having mentors and people that help me sometimes you know how to figure out how to approach things or how to get out of trouble. Um, I think that, um, you know, you just have to, uh, I've also been uh, uh, lucky to to take some training. So I do, I do, if I identify training that, that I can, uh, that helps me to, you know, to sort of approach certain things better. And some of that training could be sort of like formal training that you could get in your institute. Some of it is through, um, you know, some podcasts that you can find on the internet, reading about it um, and, 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 and identifying areas where you can learn how to collaborate better, how you can uh, learn to communicate. So collaboration means that you have to communicate, you have to listen, and you have to um, be flex, not not too flexible that you're sort of like a walkover, but flexible enough to allow people to also connect with you. And um, and that can, sometimes it doesn't work. So don't, and when it doesn't work, don't worry about it, 
right? Because we all, you know, connect in different ways. And sometimes you have to, if it doesn't work and you feel you haven't connected, it's just about managing that relationship or that situation in a way that allows you to still progress and to still do your work. So have an open mind, um, but be, uh, you know, be, be willing to give as much as you're willing to get from the others as well. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I don't think I have much to add to that. But now that we're speaking about working with people, I'd like us to get into your current role as head of training and global capacity at Welcome Connecting Science. Uh, welcome um, Connecting Science. Yeah. So I'd like you to walk us through what the role entails, what it is you're working on, what initiatives you're leading and how they are impacting genomics capacity building. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Anita. I mean, that question, I, I would say, uh, well, the first thing I want to say is um, uh, when I, many years ago, I, you know, when I was navigating my career, I never imagined that there was a role like this. Um, and now that I'm in it, I'm like, this is the role that was actually uh, perfect for me. Somehow it it is perfect for me. And that's why I'm um, ex extreme, always extremely get really excited talking about the work I do. Um, so it is a, and the, the path to getting into this role obviously is not, hasn't been straightforward. And I think a lot of people that are in these roles actually come from so many different paths. So it's not, there's not sort of like, I need to do this, 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 and that in order to get there. As you can imagine, this these roles probably didn't exist, you know, 10 years ago, you know, uh, but now it is becoming more common that you find people who are, um, uh, you know, employed and dead, particularly just dedicated to developing training uh, programs uh, that are impacting people uh, globally. So, um, so in my role, I um, I am um, mostly developing training programs and implementing training programs. I um, oversee a small team that actually do a lot of the hard work, <laughs> and uh, which is really really great. In fact, we 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 work together really well. Um, and and so my role is really to. Um, oversee that part of the pro the, the part of the program where we develop laboratory based and by uh, based genomics courses and bioinformatics courses primarily i mean we do other things as well uh but the, that's the core program is really focused on those types of courses and these courses are held here in the uk but some of them are held in uh in in africa in asia and latin america we collaborate with, with so many different institutes and and hosts and scientists so, um, so on a, you know, and, and so my role is really to, you know, to be thinking about, you know, sort of like how, you know, the strategy around that and implementing that strategy, uh, managing a small team that then uh, deliver on that. Um, and uh, another key part of my role really is the uh, sort of engaging stakeholders um, developing relationships with scientists um, from all over the world uh, who are involved, who get involved in our program, either as trainers on the courses or as hosts uh, for the courses that we run abroad. Um, and really, so it's identifying people that we can, we may be interested in working with, engaging with them, building those relationships, maintaining and nurturing those relationships. And, um, and coming up with ways that we can do things better. So having a very sort of like continuously evaluating what we are doing, how can we do better, whom do we need to engage, and at what point and so forth. So there's quite a lot of, um, at that programmatic level, um, there's quite a lot of work that um, is really around strategy, strategic planning, engagement, and, and evaluation. And then of course, on the day-to-day, -day, I do am managing um, a small team as well, who which consists of people that are uh, doing more the informatics and helping to set up some of the tools and platforms that are used for info um, bioinformatics courses and also laboratory um, based uh, uh, training. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that you also didn't know that such a role exists because I also <laughs> didn't until I was introduced to you. I didn't know there's such a role, but now I'm a fan of it. 
<laughs> but <laughs> so at this point, I'd like to invite our audience to share their questions. So if you, if you have a question, just raise your hand. But I'll start with what we have on the comments section. That is Howie. Howie says, thank you for sharing your journey, especially trying to grow the capacity of genomics and pharmacogenetics in Africa. Do you think different African countries are at a better place now in terms of taking up genomics? So you'll take that and then we'll see if we have further questions. Okay. Well, thank you. That's a good question. And um, I would say resoundingly, yes, definitely in a better place. There is a lot more going on in Africa. In fact, there is a lot of um, uh, pr uh, progress that has been um, made in uh, in the genomics space, particularly through, um, you know, consortia, sort of Africa-wide projects. And this has really been helpful in getting the community, the scientific community, more sensitized around genomics. Um, and I say this because, um, you know, so many institutions are also uh, investing in, um, in, in the infrastructure that's needed to do genomics. Um, and then in the space of pharmacogenomics, yes, indeed, there is uh, there has been quite a lot of um, uh, continued uh, work. Uh, and with all the consortia, as I mentioned, and all the uh, Africa-wide projects, this is actually happening. And so this is, in fact, um, a very uh, nice uh, example of how uh, how the results that the good results that come when people come together, you know, to to sort of like, to solve a problem. There was a big gap in genomics in Africa, and now everybody is connected and collaborating and developing infrastructure. Um, there's a lot of training in genomics. There's a lot of, um, there are a lot of projects that are funded. And, and, and of course, there are a lot of networks, small networks, big networks, you know, institutional networks. And so I, I really believe that genomics is really going to be very much transformative in, in Africa. Thank you. Um, if anyone else has a question, feel free to raise your hand and you can unmute and ask. If not, I still have my questions, so I could go on. <laughs> but yeah, um, so I could ask the next question as we give people a chance to ask theirs. Okay, so uh, you mentioned that especially when you started, when you were doing your PhD, um, genomics was not so widespread, especially in Africa, the field of genomics was still new. And, but now people have come in and they're investing in the field and there's research being done. So I was just wondering what emerging trends or technologies uh, that are coming up that you are looking forward to the most in genomics? Well, um, I guess it's it's the technologies in genomics are obviously primarily, you know, in the areas of sort of like sequencing and massive sequencing and sequencing larger and larger and more and more and being able to do that at a lower cost. So that's happening mm -hmm. already. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that some of the other technologies that I that are coming up that um, are really are going to be key uh, around the um, the application uh, actually focus more on the application of this data. So, I mean, you may know obviously that genomics has been uh, quite instrumental, was quite instrumental during the pandemic in, in informing, you know, how the diseases are spread, infectious diseases are spreading. And I believe this is going to become an even bigger um, application across the board. And that's already happening through some of the, um, uh, you know, regional. Uh, organizations uh, in Africa. Um, but having said that, um, there are, so, you know, genomic surveillance, for example, is really going, is sort of like the next big, big thing and keeping, keeping in up to date with what's going on in terms of uh, disease, infectious disease uh, is around the world. Um, there are some areas that we have in, through our program that we are obviously interested in. Um, in fact, our program is interested in uh, promoting new technologies that are coming up. And so um, we are, you know, we, we, we are looking at having, uh, having more courses that are, I guess, focused on things like single cell genomics. And this is already uh, an area that's um, a lot of um, researchers are looking into, uh, uh, into going to. 
uh, not only here in, in the UK, but actually globally. And so we have a program in Latin America where we are um, where we have uh, a very strong single cell genomics uh, community there. Um, and uh, and then the other areas, I know that uh, the areas around CRISPR, CRISPR technologies are also um, are coming up. And so we do have a, a, some courses or training that around that, but we're going to be, um, we, are th we are actually planning a way of expanding on that and, uh, and doing more um, sort of focused courses around uh, CRISPR technologies, both in terms of the lab side, but also in terms of how that uh, information or data is um, is used and, um, and and interpreted. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned the emerging technologies, and you also mentioned that you have training programs in the in the organization for them, so that if someone is interested in learning about them more, then they can apply to the programs and get to learn about them. And, and there's another now, area mm -hmm. which I forgot to mention, which is really around the data side of things. So mm -hmm. that's a big, big area, you know, having, a, there's now a lot of data is being generated. So, um, so there is a lot of interest in understanding how this data can be used and how it can be accessed, how it can be shared and all that. And um, I guess I wouldn't be doing much justice if it, I didn't mention artificial intelligence tools that are obviously the next big thing, not only in terms of research, but in everything, in probably everything that we, we'll, we are doing. And that's going to be um, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, exploring how that can be applied, uh, not only in the actual science itself. For us, we are exploring how it can be incorporated into the training that we're doing. So, um, so it's really exciting times, I think, for everyone. Thank you. Uh, so, as we head to, we're almost uh, our hour is almost up. But before we close, and as I wait for people who still have questions to ask, I would like to ask. Um, so, you you talked about your current role and all that it entails. And I was just wondering how you're able to balance the demands of your work with your personal commitments and interests and how that works. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question because I would like to know too, how do I do it? <laughs> how could I do it better? Maybe is the question. Um, so I, uh, I mean, I, you know, I'm in a position where I, like I said, I like, I love working, you know, as a team, in a team. And so one of the things that I uh, try to sort of foster a culture of teamwork with the team, whereby, um, you know, I know that there are things obviously that I, I'm able to, uh, that I need to do, but, you know, being able to allocate tasks, you know, in a way that the team can manage and, and I can best support them so I'm there to support them so um and and then of course um that allows me to spend more time thinking about you know what do we, you know the strategies and and so forth so um but so in terms of like what you know work life balance I'm really um uh, a big fan of you know taking taking um you know exercising uh taking walks I used to be a runner so that um my idea of a work-life balance is being able to incorporate uh, other activities into your, you know, daily life, uh, including exercise or being able to just, you know, take walks or do other things that are not just sitting on the computer. Whether I'm doing that, uh, well, I'd say uh, at the moment I am, uh, I am trying to to get to that balance, um, it's not always easy because sometimes you get to the balance and then sometimes you fall fall away again. So it's a struggle, I think, all the time that you're always trying to achieve that balance. Uh, but having it at the back of your mind and asking yourself, how can I do this better, um, really helps for you to just re reflect every now and again. Thanks. Thanks for helping us to know that you don't always have to have it figured out <laughs> and it's okay to have the balance, but it's okay to accept when it's not working and, fig and find out how you can make it better. So I can see we have questions. One is in the, in, in the chat and one is a hand raised. So we'll start with Kelechi. You can unmute and ask your question. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Anita. And uh, thank you very much, Dallas, for sharing your journey and experience so far. Um, my question is, given the torturous nature of your career in different roles and different responsibilities, however, um, still being able to find your niche currently, and what advice would you have for some of us young people who are still kind of in the rapids, um, you know, moving through different um, roles and trying to find our way in, in our career? What, what advice would you have for us? I guess my, my comment would be um, life is full of surprises. <laughs> so, um, but whatever you do, uh, what I always say to myself is it's taking time to reflect and see how do you make that count? And when I say, when I, what I mean by that is you do, sometimes you do things that you don't understand, or well, why am I doing it? Even when I was doing my PhD, it's like, well, why am I doing this? I don't even know why, what am I going to use it for? So it's, um, it's recognizing, you know, those moments when that is happening, but also at that, at the same time thinking, well, how do I make this count? How do I make this work? Um, so every engagement you have, and I don't mean everyone you meet on the street, but, you know, sometimes you engage with some really maybe influential people. Um, it's just identifying that, oh, OK, now you know about what this person does or what that, oh, there's this opportunity like, you know, to develop a career in, in training, development and so forth. Um, that's good to know. You bag that and you. Um, and as you go along, because you you are thinking about it, when an opportunity then presents itself, you're going to be able to pick from your bank that, oh, by the way, I know someone or, oh, by the way, actually, I've been looking for this opportunity. So don't stop. Don't stop looking and don't give up because life is indeed full of surprises. At times, you you know, you you don't really know that it may or it may things may happen. But if you're always looking and you always have it, you know, what you really want to have and what you really want to do at the back of your mind, when the opportunity arises, it will be an instant, this is the thing that I want, this is what I want to do. But at the same time, keep your networks, build your relationships, learn from people, right? So not everybody can give you what you want, as Anita mentioned, but um, don't give up, just don't give up. And I, I, I you know, I, like I said, I didn't know where I would end up necessarily. I didn't have a plan and I still don't quite have a plan, although I'm starting to actually have a plan. Uh, so if you don't have a plan, it's OK. But if you have a plan, it's also good to reflect on those plans and just to think, well, is this plan working for me? Whom do I need to talk to? Whom do I need to reach out to? What do I need to do? And if you go and you knock on someone's door and they close, shut it in front of you, it's OK. You will find someone. So don't give up. Keep looking um, and you will get there. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Go on. OK, no, Expressing my, my gratitude and um, that's that's very helpful and very heartwarming. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alice. And we have another question from Howie about your work. So in your experience with capacity building, what are some of the challenges you've seen in delivery of this training? So once you've prepared the training without delivering them and also how is the uptake? Is it as you expect or better? <laughs> um, so I, I would say because genomics is such a highly demanded field, the challenge that we have is that we are not able to fulfill the demand <laughs> and so my my challenge and this is not just my challenge i think it's a challenge to our team to our our directors uh, and even other people that are trying to do the same thing is how do we how can we what can we do to to fulfill the demand how can we meet the demand how can we either increase uh the number of courses that we're doing or do we need to you know look for different ways or avenues that we can deliver this training so that is the i guess major demand major challenge that we have at the moment and how are we doing how are we um addressing this yes so we are talking to people constantly talking to people uh, different people, different stakeholders, um, we even people that have been on our programs to understand, not only understand their needs, 
but also how best to deliver on our goal, which is to make sure that anyone who needs to learn genomics is able to re to to learn it and that we're able to reach them. So um, so there's a lot of you know work in the background there, but yeah, it is it is a challenge.